Hi, good morning, everybody. My, um, the title of my talk is, is Shoot the Hippo. And, and the thing that, was, that inspired this for me was that I started off my career with the BMW Group working in marketing. Now, do we have anybody here who works in marketing just by show of hands or has worked in marketing in the past? Yeah, yeah, quite a few people. So who of those people that have put their hands up, who can tell me what is the worst thing about working in marketing? Feel free just to, just to shout it out. What is the worst thing about working in marketing? What's your name, sir? Gareth. Gareth. Gareth, you're absolutely spot on. Everybody is an expert in marketing. You see, the problem is, as I soon learned when I was in marketing, that you'll get someone who will walk up from like the operations department or the finance team, and they'll go, oh, I don't like that advert. And it's like, well, you know nothing about marketing. You're in finance. Come on, everybody is an expert in marketing. Now, when you have a set of creative people all sitting around the table together, and there's a dispute as to which is the best piece of creative to go with, who makes the decision? It's invariably the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Now, invariably, <laughs> the hippo has no idea about marketing. They might be a chief exec, they might be a marketing director, what, whatever it is, invariably, they have no idea about marketing. And so I learned in my career that to be successful in not only marketing, but innovation, there are times when you need to shoot the hippo. The thing that I, um, I want to start with is often when I was at BMW, I found that a lot of people would say to me, well, head of innovation for BMW, that's great, but BMW is a really innovative company. And it's not like that at insert name of company here. Now, you could be forgiven for, for coming to that conclusion. So this is um, some newspaper clippings of the programme that um, I was privileged enough to, to set up and lead. And you read all this kind of stuff in the news and you think, fantastic, what a great innovative organisation BMW is. And it is. And that's true. However, there are two sides to this. Because on one hand, you can look at this and you can say, right, this is incredibly successful and here are the reasons why. On the other hand, the reality behind this story is it was born out of a lot of failure, a lot of things being unsuccessful, and a lot of having to tirelessly navigate through the corporate immune system that a big organization has. Because big organizations are really good at squeezing out anything that doesn't quite fit in their system. And if you're going to be successful in the realm of innovation, then you're going to need to find a way to navigate through that corporate immune system. So I want to tell you a bit about this journey in the time that I've got here today. And I hopefully want to share with you some things that will um, encourage you, potentially challenge you, but at least if you forget nothing else, if you remember nothing else, sorry, then you will, you will remember to shoot the hippo. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. Very rarely are the really successful innovators that I've met the smartest people in the, the room. Often, however, they are the people who will just share, who will just take their, their time, who will be more persistent with that problem. And when I hire today, I would take tenacity over brains, I would take resilience over brains, I would take sheer stubbornness and willingness to bang one's head against a wall over and over and over again over brains. Because if there is one thing that matters when it comes to corporate innovation, it's having that tenacity, that resilience. I promise you that that trumps brains any day. It is true that we really love being in our comfort zones, don't we? And often you find that in businesses, that as businesses and as groups of people in businesses, we really enjoy being in our comfort zones. But the problem is the world is changing. So in the case of Hoik and, and, and the textile industry, there are very few mills left in Hoik today. And the whole industry has, has completely changed. And, and Hoik hasn't changed with it. And all those people that used to work in mills don't really have jobs anymore. Similarly, on, on the rugby front, Hoik used to have a fantastic rugby team. 
the game changed when it was professionalised and the two pro teams in Scotland were Glasgow and Edinburgh. And that's it. And now, now the, the once kind of famous green machine, the Hoyt rugby team, it's, it's barely heard of anymore. And so, in, as I started my career at BMW, I realised that um, if, we're going to, um, if we're going to progress as an organisation, then there's go going to be an element of getting out of that comfort zone and also risking your personal capital, which in a big business counts for a lot. Now, over the course of my time at BMW, I started off in marketing and then I moved into operations and then into sales. And it was a bit like the, the journey that, that this guy goes on in The Matrix, where at the beginning of, of the film, you know how he, like this is a really old film. I, I was presenting this a, a while ago to some really young people, by young, they were like in their early 20s, and they just had blank faces, they'd never seen it before. But at the start of this film, who, for anyone who hasn't seen this, Neo gets his ass kicked completely, you know, absolutely flattened. Then by the end, he can kind of see where the punches are coming from and he can almost do it without, without looking. And that's what it felt like for me as I, um, as I continued my career. And so I'd worked out, for example, if we we're going to procure something, there were very strict procurement rules, but I had worked out the fastest possible way to buy something and just stay within the rules. Just. And, and big organisations are like this because they have all these rules and I thought I could work out just to stay on the right side, occasionally break the ones that wouldn't get me into too much trouble or that no one would notice. And, and so things were getting um, better for me, things were getting easier and then I realised there was a kind of fundamental change when my, my director of the department sat me down and said, Johnny, it's time for you to move jobs, here's three options for you. And I thought, oh, OK, I'd, I'd gone from being this graduate to actually I'm now being offered different jobs. And so at that point, my confidence grew. And I was, you know, I, as a young guy, getting more and more full of myself. And so I started this new job working in BMW's financial services business. And so I um, then had to launch two new, um, two new projects. One was a new mobility project, so the way that people move changes, fewer and fewer people are buying cars anymore. So these mobility projects were, um, were going to change how, how people kind of bought mobility. So instead of buying cars, they would be buying um, journeys. So that was one of my projects. The other one was to set up a new lending platform. So we looked at partnering with a peer-to-peer -peer lender. And at this point, peer-to-peer -peer lending was really exploding. So this was really kind of cool and unusual. And because I'd found the way to navigate through this corporate immune system, I was feeling like I was pretty unstoppable at this point. And so this is chapter two. I play this really arrogant head of, head of the class football captain, too rich for his own good kid. You can guess what happens. So... One of the great philosophers of our time, Mike Tyson. <laughs> Everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. So I've got these two things that are going to be the best things in BMW. And, um, and then I remember getting a phone call. I was in Munich for some meetings, and I got a phone call at... Um, nine o'clock in the evening from the um, managing director of this peer-to-peer -peer lender that we we're going to be working with. And I thought, you know when you see the phone ringing and you just know, like, this is not good news. So I answered the phone and, and we had a, a fairly short conversation and it ended with him saying, look, so this, this basically isn't going to work out. And I'm thinking, but I've sold the dream here to everyone, you know? And, and I'm on this unstoppable journey upwards. But no, it, it was not going to work. But the thing was, I had two projects. And it's always good to hedge your bets, isn't it? Because even though this one thing was now no longer going to work out, the other thing, we could just maybe put a little bit more polish on that and just make that look really, really good. And it would all be fine. So 
very disappointed, very surprised. Obviously, I'd hired some people. I'd spent quite a lot of money on doing this and thought, fine. So I flew back home the next day and then um, carried on. Two days later, I had one of the lawyers in my office saying, look, this, this mobility thing, this is just not going to work. Now, I had got really good at working out what's a, a no as in absolutely not, and what's a no as in this is just the basis for starting our negotiation. And like nine out of the 10 no's I just took as, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll just keep going with this until we can find something that's a bit less no. <laughs> this was not one of those situations. This was like, a, as my wife said to me with the shooting the hippo picture, no. Just absolutely not, no. And so with that, in the space of one week, my two projects, all this money, the team that had been built up, just kind of disintegrated between my fingers. Now the one saving grace was that I had an exec sponsor. So at this point, I'd got to know the, um, the CEO at the time, a chap called Ian Smith, really charismatic, energetic guy. I really looked up to him and Ian had started mentoring me and in a big corporate environment having a sponsor at a senior level is really important because it can give you that fire cover when things go wrong it can help open doors so that was the the kind of one like thing that that, that stood between me kind of dangling by a thread and then basically going into free fall so when I got the call to say that Ian was leaving the business <laughs> I felt at this point somewhat exposed because the bill was quite large of the money I'd spent and the people were still there that had been hired and I had no plan anymore. There was no plan. There was nothing we could polish up and make look good anymore because it had just completely disintegrated. And so the new CEO comes on board and he does what all new CEOs do and he goes off site with his executive team and he said, right, I want each of the department heads to come and present what they've achieved over the last 12 months and what they'll achieve over the next 12 months. And I'm kind of thinking this could be a bit awkward because although I'm an optimist, I'm a glass half full kind of person, and, and I've spent a lot of my career working in sales and marketing, so I feel like I can sell things well, I'm gonna struggle to sell exactly what it is we've done over the last 12 months. And I thought, well, maybe we should just go for broke here. Maybe this is the kind of shoot the hippo moment because the reality is I've got an opportunity now to be really honest about what some of the challenges are within BMW in terms of what we need to address to be more innovative going forward. And so I thought, okay, let's, let's go for it. Let's be honest about what we've delivered, which is nothing but let's kind of shed a bit of light on what some of the challenges are which are maybe preventing us from being as innovative as we'd want to be. So this is the first one. This is taken from a New York Times article um, entitled The 507 Most Powerful People in America. And this is often what company boards look like. And it's safe to say that there's not a great deal of diversity of thought. And so that was one of the challenges in our business because BMW, one of the great things about BMW is it churns out a lot of people that are, are kind of the same, you know, and, and we like being in the company of uh, people like us. That's why a day out of hoi is a day wasted, because you might meet someone different. And so I thought, okay, on the basis that I've, I've got a kind of executive team who are kind of look sound and have very similar experiences, Let's, um, let's try and, and shine a bit of a light on this. So I spoke to our HR manager and I said, look, can you please give me some data, because they're all accountants, of course, working in financial services. Um, can you please give me some data to say, what's the average age? I can work out if they're a man or a woman. I can work out um, what nationality they are. And please tell me how many of them are chartered accountants and their length of service in the business. So I could stand up and say, look, we have a very limited diversity of thought, in my opinion. And to back this up, here are some numbers. You're, on average, a 52-year-old white or German guy who's a qualified accountant. Now, there's nothing wrong with being any one of those things, but where you've got a skew of them, 
then of course you're going to see the world in a particular type of way. And so the fact that we didn't have that kind of diversity of thought at the executive level, that was going to be a problem if we were going to move forward a bit more successfully. So having successfully offended all of the team, bar about one, I then moved on and we talked about how the organisation was structured. So BMW, like a good um, German organisation of its size, has got lots of committees. There were committees for everything. And so in, in this joint venture that, that um, ultimately failed, I'd taken that to seven different committees. And so if we've got these heights, these, these ideas of being really innovative, then how are we going to do that if you need it to take it to a series of different committees, both in the UK and then in the mothership in Munich? It's just not going to work. And then I thought, well, I'm, I'm really going to go for broke now. My, my final point to this executive team, this, um, this is the actual picture I used from, um, from the presentation that I delivered. Can anyone guess which department this is in the organisation? Who said IT? Well done. This is the IT department. I realise I've probably just offended like a third of you. Some. My wife says I need more tact. I think she's right. But the point is this. We were really good at doing these large infrastructure projects. But what we weren't particularly good at is doing something small and nimble and agile where we were going to test something, not really knowing how it was going to work out. And so we talked about those things and ultimately those things provided a platform to say, OK, let's, let's do something differently then. And so I'm not going to talk too much about what they are because we can go into details at, at, at the end because almost what they are isn't as important as the route we went to, to get there. So chapter five, a great Mandela quote, it always seems impossible until it's done. We set up a corporate accelerator program. So we wanted to work with startup organizations um, because there were some things that we could do really well and other things we couldn't. There's some things that startup organizations um, do really well um, that we can't. And so we set up a program partnering with them and, and that was quite successful and we launched some new products um, on the back of that. And then the program was repeated and, and has now become a kind of staple part of, of the BMW organisation. And then we set up a more inward looking innovation program. So we, we set up something called the Intrapreneur Lab for people who are entrepreneurs but working in the context of, of BMW. And, and this program was all about um, teaching them how to successfully navigate through the corporate immune system that any big organization has. And so that program was quite successful too. But then for me, the, um, the, the, the journey didn't really end there because it kind of posed the question after 13 years working for the BMW group, is it time to leave Hoik again? You know, is it time to get out of that comfort zone? Because I'd really grown to love BMW. I had a fantastic time there. And so thinking about that, that quote from, from The Matrix where he's offered the two pills, you, you know the bit I mean, and he says you can take the, the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up, you believe what you want to believe. And that was basically what I, I could have done at BMW. Um, or you can take the red pill, and you stay in Wonderland, a bit whole goes. And so for me, I decided after, after 13 years, I would leave BMW. I joined this technology organization, which is actually owned by the Volkswagen Group, believe it or not. That was a bit awkward when, uh, when I mentioned that at, uh, at the BMW HQ. But ultimately, it, it was an opportunity to, to try and um, practice uh, what I had learned over the preceding years and hopefully become one of those hippos that is willing to be shot from time to time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.